Hello, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are today. Uh, thank you for joining the live stream. This is our first Tuesday live stream of the new year. So thank you for being here today. Happy New Year to everyone. I hope uh, 2022 is off to a great start. Uh, we have an exciting guest for you here today, which I'm I'm going to uh, do formal introductions here in just a moment. Um, but before I do that, um, what I thought we'd do is, uh, if you don't mind, I'd, I'd love to hear where everyone's joining from today, on whichever platform you're listening or watching, whether you're on LinkedIn, YouTube, uh, Twitter, Facebook, um, even Twitch. I think we're streaming to Twitch right now. So any whatever platform you're watching on, we'd love to hear your uh, feedback as to um, where you're at today, just so we get a, a good idea of, of where the audience is from. And secondly, if you have questions uh, throughout the discussion today, um, I encourage you to please drop those questions in the chat box. We're watching all the streams right here, so we'll be able to see the questions as they come through. And don't worry about interrupting us. You can ask the questions whenever you have them. And we'll, we'll get to them um, as we get through the conversation here. So just to set the context for today's discussion before we jump in and do the introduction, um, I just want to set the context for the topic of discussion and, and the reason why I wanted this next guest to be on the live stream here today. Um, first of all, I think the one of the benefits of digital transformations, one of the opportunities in digital transformation is to learn from other organizations and look to see what, what's happening in the marketplace, um, what are some of the quantitative findings that organizations are experiencing. We all have anecdotal stories. We have hearsay. We have examples from our own qualitative history, but it's always helpful to look at uh, data sets. And so I had the good fortune of uh, being invited to an event in Germany um, last late last year in October of 2021. And uh, it was organized by our next guest and in, in our discussions and as part of the planning and af after going to Germany and being part of this event, I got to learn a little bit more about some of the research that he is doing in the digital transformation space. And it's, it's truly fascinating because not many people do this work. So what I thought would be fun was to have him on our live stream, on our uh, podcast, some, some questions about the research. What, what is he seeing in the market? What's some of the quantitative data telling him uh, in his team in the research? So well, with all that being said, I wanted to uh, introduce uh, Norbert, Professor Norbert for now. Uh, thank you for being here today, Norbert. Yeah, thank you very much, Eric. Thank you for inviting me to this uh, live stream. Absolutely. And conversation. First of all, maybe just a, um, I haven't said much about your background, I, other than the fact that you're a professor and you do research, but maybe you could tell us a little bit about yourself, where you teach, uh, what your background is, etc. Yeah, of course. I, I, I'm an engineer by study. And uh, there's a noise somebody mentions. Uh, I don't know what the noise is from. Um, and then I needed a job at the university and I went to computer science and uh, I stayed there for a couple of years. I um, finished my PhD and then I got tenure at another university and uh, then and all the time I did some consulting around ERP and uh, all other business information systems but only uh, when a customer would call me and say he had a very difficult problem that other consultancies could not solve so i came into the consulting area and uh, 10 years ago i founded my my own uh, consulting company potsdam consulting and advisory and uh, i think uh, our insights and i will come to research and to the combination of research and practice in a minute um, especially when you ask me some questions about that um, our special insight is uh, that um, we look at the technology so what is an actual t current technology uh, but we are not computer science guys because we do not ignore people we do not ignore users managers middle managers and so on and we think additionally that the process the business process the value generating process is also quite important and so we we, we have this triangle and we we always see in research and in um, consulting the the sides of this triangle right right so you, you see you've been in this space for quite some time you you're uh... yeah. In addition to your consulting, you're also a professor at University of Potsdam. 
Um, what what courses do you teach there? Maybe tell us a little bit about your academic oh, side. Oh, your- yeah. Well, yesterday I I I, I taught uh, both sides of um, of the scale. Uh, first, uh, for for beginners, uh, business administration <clears throat> and information systems beginners, I taught some uh, SQL stu- structured query language, very um, basic. Uh, instructions and uh, then uh, later on for our master program uh, i told architectures of um, uh, business systems of information systems in business so these huge landscapes that huge companies like uh, the telecom companies the airline companies car manufacturers have hundreds of different information systems and how to manage in practice these information systems to to uh, to, um, keep pace with technology advance and uh, yeah, well, with the, with the business advancements. So this is uh, both sides of the scale. Uh, I taught uh, yesterday in the same uh, morning. Yeah, great. So you've, you've got a pretty varied background, ranging from detailed beginner technology sort of yeah. uh, te- technical courses all the way to some of the more strategic yeah. stuff, which yeah. yeah. We'll talk yeah, about it. Exactly, exactly. That makes uh, the the profession so so interesting. And we have the saying in Germany: if you can do it, then you should do it. If you can't do it, then teach it. And uh, sorry to say that if you can't teach, then go into consulting. So uh, I'm in all three areas. I'm doing, and <laughs> I'm also in uh, consulting, and sometimes I also teach. Here we are. Yeah. So, okay. Um, <laughs> So, so quick question for for you then. Um, and sorry to interrupt. I lost my feed for a second there, so I, I missed part of what you said. But I wanted to, to ask you a, a quick follow up question on the um, uh, on the ERP Congress, which is the event that I yeah. met you at for the first time in person. This was the event in October of 2021, and you asked me to speak yeah. at that event. Tell us a little bit about ERP Congress in Germany and sort of you know what what was the impetus for that, and then we'll get into some of the. Uh, questions about your your research after that. Yeah, Th- thank you for that question. We organize this congress uh, every year as a, a event, as an event for around the the ERP prize competition. We hand out an award every year for some of the best ERP vendor companies and the the best ERP products in in Europe or in in uh, the German speaking countries uh, at least. And um, this is. Um, there, there's a fight every year of um, um, to get this uh, award to be awarded with this this um, uh, thing. It's like an Oscar for the ERP industry. Um, Pretty big deal. And uh, yeah, <laughs> around this um, this uh, award ceremony, we organize a conference and uh, invite some famous keynote speakers uh, like you, Eric, uh, in, in the last year. And we try to inform uh, neutrally, so without uh, taking any sides, what is happening in the areas of technology, uh, what uh, what should um, companies do when they have a problem with their existing ERP system or when they want to go into new businesses or want to find out what's... The, what's um, uh, the advantage of using uh, AI or uh, what, whatever big data or an analytics or something like that. That's the it's, it's a two day um, event, uh, and it uh, yeah we are a little bit exhausted afterwards, but it's uh, it's a very good event because it's the the main German ERP event. You can name it that way. Okay, great. Yeah, it was a it was a great event and. Um... Even though there was a lot I didn't understand because so much of it was it was in German, it was very good content from what I could uh, gather out. Oh, thank you I very was, much. I had Google Translate open the entire time so I could enter words. Oh, very good. Translate very to good. English because I don't yeah. speak German. <laughs> uh, but it was a very good, um, very good session. I enjoyed it, and it was it was fun to meet you and, and other team members there too. Um, so I guess to start, um, and actually I'm going to ask the audience a question or ask them to respond to this real quickly, and then I'm going to jump into the questions I have for you. But for the audience, those of you that are, that are watching this live, I'd love to hear, you know, if you think about ERP and digital transformation research or benchmarks or data, what what kind of data would you be looking for, you know, as far as just things that would be of interest or topics of interest or uh, data sets that might be interesting to help uh, provide some lessons to your digital transformation project, wherever you might be in your journey? I guess that's more of a question for the audience, because I'd love to see kind of what 
what metrics would they expect to see or what, what sort of metrics would they be interested in seeing from your data, assuming it exists. Um, yeah. So while the audience is a answering that question in the, in the live chat here, um, question for you then is, is maybe just give us a little bit of, of, of an overview of some of this research you've done over the years. You know, what, what does it look like? What, it, what were you trying to find? What do you, you know, what, what was the impetus for the whole thing? Yeah, we we started 20 years ago when I uh, was invited to a big German car a car parts manufacturer. The, he made the gearboxes and I, uh, I was asked, uh, we have a tiny requirement to change in our uh, information system. I don't say the name of the vendor, but it's one of the main vendors of ERP systems in the world and it's not coming from the US but from Germany. Uh, we have a tiny new requirement, a very tiny requirement and it costs us millions literally millions of uh, dollars or, or uh, euros um, to fix this uh, tiny requirement. Can't there be a more adaptive, we, we coined the, the word adaptive or changeable uh, enterprise system that is much easier to uh, adapt to new requirements. So that was our first um, uh, task in, in research and we came up with a lot of ideas how new architectures of ERP systems should be um, provided but uh, to, to make it short uh, none of nearly none of these ideas is um, made it into practice because we have this uh, relational database um, paradigm and uh, we have some applications uh, running on application servers and the, the data models grow and grow and grow and the data itself also grows and so the systems are becoming complex and more complex and even more complex and when you read about um, uh, missing success with uh, implementing new ERP systems, that's partly also a problem of the complexity and some, some, there are even some people outside that think interfaces between different systems are bad and you should try to integrate everything into one single system. Uh, that I, I don't know whom that helps, uh, but uh, it does not help uh, conquer or even manage the complexity. So that was the, f the first task. And then we started another thing that we are continuing to do. We count beans, not, not beans, but numbers of um, installations of ERP systems in the German speaking market. German speaking market is about 120 million people, so it's not, not very big, but a lot of small and medium sized ERP vendors are located in, in these German speaking countries. I mentioned one, I didn't mention it by name, but uh, I mentioned it by um, um, the place of birth in Germany, in Waldorf, Germany, one of the big uh, vendors stemming from there. It is, it's a huge one, the SAP, but there are many more than 300, 400 smaller ones. And then later when we looked into other countries, we see these small vendors in, in nearly every other country, whether it's South Africa, it's the UK, it's the United States. You, you can sustain an ERP business as a vendor when you have 30 to 50 people working for you. Then it's even then it's sustainable. It will it will not grow and it will not um, adapt all new technologies and business opportunities very fast. But you 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 can survive, and so we have the situation that we have three hundred different ERP systems, and that's part of my consultancy to find out which is the, is the best uh, long term. Long term means at least for ten years for for my customers. Yeah, and on the other hand, um, perhaps we, we will come to that uh, as well. On the other hand, um, the vendors are also, the, the small and medium-sized vendors ask me and my team at the university. I have about uh, 45 people running or uh, working for me at the university. And they ask me, we read about new technologies like, like AI. Now, now the main technology where what, what I can overview, the, the, the ERP vendors um, make some, um, some investments in, the main technology is AI, artificial intelligence. So they, they desperately try to make more use of the huge amount of data they, they collected. 
and but we we see um, and we can come to it in a minute uh, we see that there are of course some some other capabilities required not only technology not only developers uh, but some some other um, capabilities are required so this is um, we see the technology, we see the process, we see the business advantages, all the business disadvantages. And you, you prepared some very nice questions. What, what are the issues? What do I recommend? Perhaps we come to that later. Yeah. Right. Well, I guess just to start then, you know, that's a helpful overview of sort of the two threads or the two main drivers of why you started this research and what, what problem you were trying to solve or what questions you were trying to answer. But when you look at, um, just ERP implementations, digital transformations in general, what were some of the, Yeah, you've been doing this a long time, but what are some of the biggest findings you have, whether they're quantitative or qualitative findings from, from your research? What are some of the yeah. biggest so, lessons? Uh, we, we can um, distinguish several phases. In the first phase, it was just um, automation. No, it was not even automation. It was just bringing manual processes to computerized processes not not very much automation but you wanted to have your your data on a computer to be able to be accessed from anywhere and uh, uh, from more people than before that was the first phase um, that went till I, I would say the early 2000s so then the, there came a phase of consolidation uh, because there was not so much um, um, innovation in the ERP area, more functionality, yes, and more uh, more specific data models, yes, but but no innovation. Then many managers in companies came to the conclusion ERP is quite expensive, and we can cut cost on ERP. We can um, lift. Um, we can. We can. We, we do not need um, a maintenance contract. We we do not need upgrades anymore. We do not need uh, qualified people in our company. But we can always call India for uh, support. And um, this is the second phase. We see that a lot of um, competitive advantage vanished in this period of time and since i would say three to five years we have the third phase the, uh, and this is the taking the erp system as the backbone of the business information processing and trying to implement uh, innovation like ai like big data like um, yeah analytics and, and so on and um, uh, but not only into ERP, but in, in other systems connected to the ERP landscape. And this is the third phase. And this, this makes more fun, of course, because if you always have cost-cutting discussions, that's, that's no fun at all, because it does not end with the vendor. It also comes to you as, uh, as a consultant. But if you, can, if you see companies that want to spend money to improve their competitive ability with IT, then the fun starts and then uh, some and, and then corona came the covid virus then uh, in some companies the fun just stopped again but uh, we 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 have some some e-tailers so so e-commerce uh, retailers um, that that did very well during uh, the covid uh, pandemic and uh, they spent tremendous amounts of money to improve their competitive ability and their to to make their processes better and uh, that's the third third stage well yeah your <laughs> your company is also <laughs> named but this is uh, this is uh, a parallel i didn't think of before um, this is stem stems from our um, observation of nearly 2000 erp projects in the last 20 years in in the german speaking um, countries so these three stages and now we are in a fun state uh, on the one hand last sentence but on the other hand some companies that thought e it is not important people that know of it are not important they don't do well now they have problems they have real real problems now interesting so so the three phases then you had the uh the first phase the first stage which was the um, sort of the initial automation second stage. Yeah, computerization i would call it computerization it's uh, yeah Okay. Now we can talk. We can we can speak of of automation, but in the first years it was just computerization. Yeah, yeah, just just taking but, manual processes and moving them yeah. to, to computers. Yeah, second stage was cutting costs, but potentially yeah. at the 
expense of also cutting value, business value. Yeah. And then the third thing now is the sort of the competitive advantages using digital to to further yeah. their business models. What are in this third stage that you're seeing now in the last three to five years? What what are some of the big findings? I mean, what what are um, you know what are some of the trends or some of the the, the data sets or, or high level metrics that really stand out or jump out? Um, you know, from from your research. Um, yeah, I see the the AI trend, uh, artificial intelligence trend, is more a trend for vendors for now. It's not mm -hmm. where the the customers, my customers, my my customers from the industry ask me, what um, can we for what can we use AI? And I tell them, well, you you need you need the data, you need the models to to for prediction, and you need the use cases, and then you can start. And when we, but when we look at the data, it's uh, this master data management topic is uh, some some uh, topic that uh, does not work well in most companies. So they have very individualistic data sets, and um, AI in the ERP um, area doesn't work well with uh, very scarce data sets. The AI works well when you have millions of uh, unique uh, data, but not when, when you have uh, there a little bit and there a little bit and no no bridge between, between it. So so that's uh, one of the problems. What, what uh, we have a question here in the, in the fr from the audience about value, uh, the value of ERP and the value of these investments. So um, what, 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 what we do, what we always try to do is to calculate the value of the investment. Um, we do this uh, of the ERP or the IT technology investment. We do this uh, while we uh, compare the actual state with the old processes and the old functions with the intended state when we have uh, automated processes and when we, when we have all system functionality available. Mm. Uh, because that is Sometimes diff different when the when, when you use a, a system with a huge functionality, you have more functions, but system is sometimes also more expensive. And on the other hand, uh, you can get a lot of improvements, like in manufacturing and logistics, when you use a smaller and, and cheaper system. So, and we compare this, and when you compare this, then uh, you always can come up with some productivity gains, with um, the opportunity to reach more revenues or to cut cost on um, stock uh, stocks and uh, things like that. Like that, and uh, that is um, yeah, that is that, that there are some. Um, Sums that are big, so big means uh, six or seven figures, and some are very small. And of course, no company uh, we investigate has uh, more than 20 uh, ROI potentials in their processes, but otherwise they would no longer exist when they, when they had 100 or we, 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 we come, we also, we, we always go into the company with about 300 or 400 questions about ROI. Um, always, always covering one single functionality and uh, well 20 turn out as valid and then we can um, sum it up and come up with uh, some uh, uh, information about the potential value and this is in, in, in one case the investment is 7 million over 7 years uh, seven mil and we can compare euro and US dollar here for 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 this um, interview, uh, seven million in seven years, and um, the yearly um, return on investment is about two point five million euro. So that means in three years, um, your seven years cost are covered, and then you you are not only even, but uh, you are better than before. This information is quite um, necessary for some of the companies because they have to report to boards or to owners or the publicly noted and, and, and then they have to, um, to, to figure out to, to say to um, they have to yeah justify their investment in IT because money is always scarce and everybody in manufacturing loves to buy new machines because you can see the machine for five million even if the machine is not running you <laughs> at least have the machine uh, standing in your factory but uh, a new enterprise system a new IT 
you do not see anything. You you see a new icon on your browser, and this is two million euro for or two million dollar for a new icon. That's quite expensive. So you, you, it's absolutely necessary that you need to calculate the business value. And um, yeah, we we have some experience with, with that with the, with this calculating the the value. Uh, unfortunately, not all our customers want to have us calculating the value. Some say, well, it's evident. It's self-evident that we need a new right. system, and then we calculate the cost, or the ven the vendor calculates the cost of the new system, and then they say, "Well, it's uh, quite expensive, and can't we, yeah, can't we come up with uh, another solution?" And then we wished we had calculated also the business value. So business value is quite important, and it's possible to calculate it, but you need a little bit of experience for that. So is that the the numbers you just mentioned the seven million dollar total investment and then the two point yeah. five million uh, yeah. will return is that an average in your data set is that is that the average cost and ROI for for the average no or is that well that, that is it depends from from many factors it depends uh, as you know how many uh, users you have concurrent users or named users how many um, mm. uh, application consulting is necessary uh, so it's um, well um, I try to convince my business customers when there is an ROI over two to three years then the investment is fine mm -hmm. because you have always an acceleration curve uh, in learning so you don't you don't you you can't use 100% of your new system from day one, but uh, you 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 slowly uh, discover new uh, new new information there and new value, and uh, but after one or two years you know everything what uh, is necessary and then you have the full potential there. So so two years is fine. Uh, in some cases, in very rare cases, there is no business value. Mm. Um, or not, not no sufficient business value, but uh, some of these companies have um, neglected their IT, their ERP for ten to twenty years. I I once mm. met a company that had no maintenance contract for twenty years, twenty one years, no maintenance contract. So that means they have a, a software solution that was probably invented in the nineteen nineties. Uh, for right. for Windows ninety five, and right. uh, and now we yeah we have different times here and uh, uh, they they the, yeah the, there is no business value because the investment is now huge but it's nevertheless necessary. So what percentage approximately? If you had to, what, you, I don't know if you have this exact data in front of you or uh, in memory, but what, approximately how many? Um, digital transformation and ERP projects do you think receive a positive ROI within two to three years, as you as you mentioned, in this third stage we're talking about? I know 10 or 20 years ago, maybe it's a different number, but more recently, what, what kind of uh, metrics are you seeing there? It looks like we just lost Norbert, so I'm going to give him a second to come back on here, and he's back. There he is. Yeah, I'm back. So, so I, I, I got your question, but... Um... Your question was, uh, how many of these projects have a positive ROI from the third stage? Well, unfortunately, um, uh, we, we observed uh, post-mortem, not, not post-mortem, post-project 2000, uh, around 2000 of these uh, projects. But of course, nearly nobody wants to tell us uh, what was the investment. We, they, they only tell us what was, what was the number of um, licenses they bought. And, uh, but, but nearly never they tell us uh, how, how much consulting effort they spent. So I, I, I cannot come up with a, with a key figure, how, how much is um, uh, uh, how, the okay. success rate. You... But I can, I can say when it will be absolutely not successful when IT is a commodity, when uh, you don't build up knowledge in your company on on ERP, mm. and uh, when you are not bold in your decisions, and fourth and last, when you do not hold to your initial objectives, so your initial goals, what you wanted originally to achieve with the new system. 
So right. when, when, when you don't do this, all, all of this, then you won't be successful. <laughs> so, you, so you see the correlation of what, what yeah. not to do um, and, yeah. and the impact it, the negative impact it has on, on your, on your outcome. Yeah. Um, do you, do you have a sense from your, um, from your quantitative and qualitative data of whether or not with, with new emerging technologies like AI, you mentioned before, yeah. where it's more of a thing for vendors. Vendors are more focused on AI than actual uh, end, end users, which I totally agree with, by the way. That's what we see with our clients as well. It's, it's yeah. very immature in terms of real use cases. Yeah. But with these new emerging technologies that have a certain price tag that go along with it, and even cloud solutions too, where you have ongoing subscriptions and sort of a higher annual ongoing cost, are you seeing a trend, either positive or negative, towards getting more or less of an ROI, even even though you don't have exact numbers because a lot of uh, companies aren't sharing the the exact cost yeah. or the exact benefit? Do you do you have a, at least have a sense of where the needle is moving? Is it go, is it getting better? Is it getting worse? What do you see there? Well, uh, it depends how the project is conducted. When the project is conducted in a nice manner and uh, not everybody who has a wish or a requirement gets this requirement uh, implemented, then you can um, get a, a huge uh, ROI and business value. Um, especially when, when you stay to your original goals and, and objectives, what, what you wanted to achieve in, in, in the market. Um, but the problem is um, the situation, the environment is changing. Uh, you know, the, the um, uh, company management uh, changes, um, ownership ch changes, uh, the economic environment uh, might change uh, for, for some companies. We, we have some legislation in Europe, like these um, GDPR uh, topics that cost a lot of money and helps nearly nothing uh, for, for, for the customers. So, so it's, it's not quite easy because the, the subject of study, the company and the ERP system does not stay in the same state for two years mm -hmm. or for three years. If you right. compare the, the, your companies, uh, you, you, you observe uh, from, from 2019, which was pre-pandemic to 2022, you, you will find out that the organization has changed, um, the business model in some cases has changed, the products have changed, customer behavior has changed. So that's a, the problem problem of reality. Everything is changing. So it's, it's not so easy to put something in concrete and watch it. <laughs> Uh, right. for, for for two or three years. So uh, unfortunately, I cannot say uh, it's always forty three percent. That's right. therefore I'm too much professor to answer this. Uh, in, <laughs> in, 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 right. uh, you sound you're starting. You sound like me. I it, it depends, right? It depends on what. Yeah, the, yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's it's uh, typically a lawyer would say it depends. Yeah. <laughs> right. Right. Or consultants or professors. I guess that's what we've established. Yeah. 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 We, we, we all, <laughs> Um, so in the research you've done over the 20 years, whether, you know, I, I'll, maybe I'll leave you flexibility on how you want to answer this, whether you focus on the third, the more recent third phase or stage of ERP yeah. uh, implementations or whether you look more uh, longer term, what are some of the, um, the biggest surprises in, in the data? Like, at, you know, when you started consulting and then you do this research, yeah. what, what sort of jumped out as sort of a, a surprise to you or something you didn't know? Maybe some big learnings from, um, from we, we always ask um, the customers, uh, the, the customers that buy a new ERP system or use a new ERP system, what influences their decision. And of course, in the first years, functionality was on top functionality 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 and of course that's that's the reason you buy a standard software system because you want to have immediate use of a predefined functionality but what comes then in the early uh, days it was uh, um, of course a cost advantage and usability and things like that uh, because the older systems like these green screen uh, systems had not a very great usability for tasks you did not do daily. For daily tasks, it was fantastic. I remember these United clerks at the gates at United Airlines, and you wanted to do a complete complex uh, operation of rebooking your flight, and they clack, 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 and in 30 seconds, they were ready, new boarding pass, a new invoice, collect your credit card, and so on. That was fantastic because they do it every day. But for right. in, in ERP, you have a lot of um, tasks you do once a month, month or once a year and therefore usability was 
in need, very much in need. That has changed. Usability is no longer an issue, but um, the architecture, the technical architecture of the system is now the number two in mm. deciding uh, in decision making on a new ERP system. And that was something uh, that I always, I'm always a, an architecture guy, but I'm a, uh, I'm a computer scientist by, by, by my uh, PhD, but most of the managers out there are no computer scientists, but business administration people. And now they also decide to go for the good architectures. So we have to, we as a consult, we as consultants, and also we uh, at the university have to come up with a judgment: what is a good architecture, not only for the ERP as a single system, but for the whole landscape of IT systems uh, you have out there. And that is mm -hmm. uh, an, um, an interesting topic, also for the next couple of years. Yeah, that is very interesting. I mean, it. it fits what, it, what I believe to be important, but it's interesting to hear that buyers of enterprise technology are viewing that as a very important number two yeah. criteria. Yeah. Um, what um, what are some of the other general trends? You, you talked a little bit about AI and you talked about how, uh, you know, the three different stages of yeah. transformation over the years. Um, you've talked about how uh, architecture is becoming more important. Technical architecture is becoming important in the evaluation process. What other trends are you seeing? What are some of the other trends that enterprise software buyers are potential yeah. buyers are <clears throat> There is a, a very interesting uh, gap between uh, what vendors want. They want to get their customers into the cloud and right. what the uh, customers actually do because they calculate um, and in many cases, more than I expected, they come to the conclusion that cloud is way too expensive. So they, mm -hmm. they, they do not go, in that, in that case, they do not go the whole way to the cloud, but they stop halfway and go, for instance, for hosting or housing or some other services in that area. So they, they, don't, they no longer do it for, your, for themselves. They, they don't have the, the hardware in the basement and try to fulfill all the security requirements. But um, sorry right. for uh, the noise here, uh, but uh, they, they don't go into the cloud like with completely new offers. So some, some offers like data storage or, or also analytics capabilities. We will see it also with AI when the models, the AI models will be available. They will be in, uh, in the cloud. They, they won't be ever available on the hardware in the basement of the factory. But uh, with the traditional systems, at least our our what we see in in Europe, it's not only Germany; it's Europe. Um, uh, we see customers are reluctant to go in in the cloud. That's sometimes an infrastructure topic, but sometimes sometimes it's a trust topic. But mm -hmm. sometimes, it's, in, in most cases, it's a, a cost topic because the cloud. Uh, is cheap in the first year and in the second year, but afterwards it's expensive because the costs are the same every year and a license is um, license is paid and then you have usage of the license, you have maintenance contracts, but so, so cloud is not so fast in the ERP business because ERP, I would not say this of CRM and of some other um, IT services uh, like uh, Office 365 and, and, and things like that, but for, I, for ERP, the cloud adoption rate is slow. Yeah. 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 And I think the, um, the vendors benefit more than anyone from this and, and their investors benefit yeah. more because you get a, a predictable, sustainable revenue model that's very high margin. Yeah that investors like, vendors like it. And so therefore that becomes the talking point, which is cloud is better. Cloud is better, yeah. everyone's moving to cloud. If you don't move to the cloud, you're dying. So I think it's a really good uh, point that you bring up, which is, you know, you can go to the cloud if it, where it makes sense, but it doesn't mean you need to double down and just throw yeah. everything in the cloud right now because yeah, it makes exactly. cost. I'd be curious to see, I've always thought, and this is speculation or sort of a uh, hypothesis of what I think will happen in the future. You talked about that second stage of where companies sort of yeah. went from from computerization to then how do we cut our costs to kind of cut back yeah. on our, our uh, how much we're spending on IT. Do you think we'll see another phase of that after? So you get all these companies that are moving to the cloud and then they wake up one day and realize, wow, we're spending a lot of money 
on these subscriptions that we can't get out of. Um, do you think there'll yeah. be a sort of day of reckoning in three or five or 10 years where people will maybe shift back and maybe try to cut, scale back their cloud contracts or move back to on-premise or do something different? Or do you think this is just where we're going? Uh, I think, no, I, I don't think uh, they will shift back, but there will be more competition uh, with cloud services because because mm. cloud services are more comparable to each other. And um, the step uh, away from one cloud vendor or functionality vendor to, to a couple of vendors is, is easier when you are in the cloud because uh, the next right. uh, possible service provider is for, for some a bill of material calculation or, or uh, warehouse management is only one click away. So we will see a competition there. I, do, I, I don't think that's my that's my proposition. I don't think they they will come back and uh, install right. ERP systems under their desktops. But uh, I, I I think we will see more um, competition in the cloud uh, competing on some services. Yeah, that'll start to drive some of that cost down. Yeah. So you get more options and yeah. All Exactly. Okay. Yeah, that, that's interesting. Um, what are uh, you, you? You alluded to this. You, you started to answer this uh, indirectly related to another question, but maybe I'll ask it more explicitly here. Yeah. But that is Please. what. What in your research? What are some of the issues or challenges uh, that organizations are struggling with the most in their ERP implementations or digital transformations? As I mentioned before, when IT is seen from the management as a commodity like uh, electrical power, then uh, it comes to problems. So, uh, we, we, and um, uh, it is, uh, uh, it influences the competitive ability in both ways. If you um, go forward with your IT, it influences in a positive way. But if you don't go forward, it influences in a negative way. And you create cost on, in, in, uh, in personnel, in, in management efforts, and also in IT maintenance efforts. And you can't cut these uh, without um, uh, giving you danger to your business processes. So, so this is uh, what, what, what I see in some of the managers' decisions. They have not yet seen that IT is not the same like telephone service or like uh, electrical power or gas, uh, but it's something different. It's something that has to be invested in and uh, also knowledge has to be um, collected in the company. And I always tell my customers in, in, in consulting, you can't rely on forever on me. You have to, <laughs> you have to right. find out something on your own. <laughs> right. Yeah. But only yeah. something, you know, not, not everything. Right. Right. I'm, so, I'm, so coming back to this, this cloud um, trend uh, question, I'm going to uh, share a question here, which is uh, from Malcolm on LinkedIn. He asked the question of uh, how many on-premise systems will there be in five years? Do you, do you have a, a sense of maybe a rough percentage or I know you, you, you probably don't have data that predicts that, but, or maybe you do, I don't know. What, what are your, but what's your opinion on that? Well, we, we, um, uh, I, I told you that the, um, transfer rate to the cloud is slow and i would say we have when i, I make a bold judgment now we have in the europe in the german speaking countries i would say we have 80 80 percent of the systems are running on premise uh, mm. when you also think that housing and uh, hosting is also on premise because it's uh, it's an individual system on individual hardware maintained uh, in an individual state of software uh, so it's uh, it's only the I, the 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 ethernet uh, cable the ethernet connection is different but it's it's not cloud cloud means it's anywhere and um, it may not even be on a certain hardware uh, and, and therefore, I, I think 80% are on premise now. And now you ask me how much of this, I would say 70% will be on premise in, in five years. We, okay. we should meet, Eric, we should meet at least in five years and <laughs> I will. speak about that uh, prediction. Yeah. January of 2027, you, you're saying yeah. that be so 10% more will be in the yeah. cloud? Okay, yeah, that's... only 10% more. Yeah. Okay, that's very interesting. I may be wrong. I may be wrong, but uh, in the moment, I see adoption rate is quite slow and costs are very, very high. 
and uh, every manager can calculate the costs and says, well, what sh why, why should I do that? Where, where is my business advantage? Right, right. Yeah. So uh, you alluded a little bit to this last uh, a few minutes ago, but, uh, but I'll uh, bring up this question from Andre on YouTube. Yeah. Yeah. Question of uh, how has the pandemic influenced digital trends? Yeah, um, we we see a, a main influence, of course, in uh, thinking of work from home. Uh, some managers didn't want to have work from home before the pandemic, and we see it in the digitalization of the processes. So things that were never ever um, available before the pandemic are now easily done and implemented. I give you an example uh, what me astonished today. Uh, I'm working at a university. You know, university administration centers are never um, at the forepoint of, advanced, of, of, of um, innovation. And um, I had to clear an invoice and I got an email and I just had to click a link in my email and I could do this on my iPhone. So I could send, say, uh, this invoice can be cleared on my iPhone by clicking, by just clicking a, a, an email, a link on my iPhone. So, and that was a real advantage. And this public administration moved in only two years pandemic from we do everything on paper to we do everything digital now. So the, I, 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 I use hmm. this example, not because it's a prototype for doing business, but because even the most hard minded or, or no minded uh, no, uh, people at all now think what can we do better in the processes? How, how can we advance and digitalize the processes? And that uh, experience we see also in, in the companies and also this work from home paradigm we have this discussion all the time. You see Apple, first they should all work uh, again in, in the headquarter. And now they say, well, you may work two days at home. So, And, and we see it in the German companies as well uh, that uh, uh, it, it does not depend to some extent uh, where the work is done. To some extent, it's quite important. So uh, we, we cannot cut uh, social uh, contacts uh, completely. We, I would say uh, two days at home and three days at the workplace might be good uh, for both of, <laughs> for, for, the ven for the employer and the employees. So, so I see um, things uh, speeding up in the, in the, in the processes. Um, I see very huge strains on the infrastructure because uh, all these videos, uh, 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 videos going on and then you have to switch off your camera and then yeah, yeah then you are nearly dead yeah, you have a meeting uh, an important business meeting with eight to ten people and everybody has to switch off the camera then pff, it's you, you 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 can only work there when you know all these people very very well so right. when you can listen to them and oh this might be a little bit snarky but but uh, you you can't do anything so so infrastructure strain in in some areas it's a huge problem and um, well the erp vendors we, we uh, they have to do something with uh, robotic process automation that, which is an automation on on the desktop of the users um, that but that has that has nothing to do with the vendors itself um, in my opinion and and that's what i see yeah sure the straight sure. Oh, yeah that's that's interesting that's very very interesting um what about uh, this question? Actually, I'm gonna I'm gonna change this question a little bit. Uh, the, but the question is: Is the German cloud market affected by German legal requirements yeah. governing where data can be held and how secured? I would actually ask that question more globally because that, that's also a thing. And you know, if you work yeah. if you work for the United States government or you're a contractor to the United States government, you have certain data requirements and limitations, yeah. and privacy is becoming a big deal throughout Europe um, and and other parts of the world. So maybe just in general, how do you know, individual countries and their legal requirements um, affect uh, the, the cloud market in general? Yeah, it depends in which industry are in. Uh, if you are in a very highly regulated industry, um, then uh, there are some rules. If you are a state or government owned entity, then you're, there are um, uh, certain rules. Um, 
some companies like like e-tailer or retailer are free of that and uh, they have to take care of um, customer data and and, and person uh, related data to, to, to single persons uh, but that can be done well that it has an influence yes it, it the cloud market is a little bit influenced by by that. I would not say that we have this European initiative um, to 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 come up with a European cloud solution, but um, this is called Gaia X. Uh, but it's um, well, it's an it's an initiative from engineers and. Uh, you, sh you should think from the user. You should not think from the engineering uh, uh, point of view. And uh, it's it's overcomplicated, this this uh, European cloud initiative. So uh, Amazon, Microsoft, and some, some others, Google, are doing uh, here a very good job. And uh, show us where the data is uh, in, in Europe. They have all the data centers in Europe. And um, for, for most of the not regulated companies, not no military things, no um, uh, drugs, uh, I mean uh, in a positive sense drugs, uh, medicine, pharma, pharmaceutical companies, uh, for, for most of them, that's not a problem. Right, right. In my opinion. Always, this is all my opinion, you know. Sure, sure. Well, and it, sure. it's an important one just based on what you're seeing and the, and the way companies are shifting. I think that's where we're getting to is just how how's the com how are companies shifting and how are uh, how's the economy shifting, how's re how are regulations shifting, and that's a, just a good reminder of all the different things you have to navigate and stay in sync with as you go through an ERP project or, or digital transformation. Um, so, uh, just for quick a question, I guess I'd I'd ask you around um, a lot of your research is based in in Eastern Europe or the German speaking uh, countries within uh, yeah. Eastern Europe. but what what what's different in that part of the world when it comes to ERP implementations or digital transformations what's different yeah. there unique there versus other parts of the world or, or vice versa yeah we, we we sometimes see also smaller vendors from from other countries coming to the german market because they heard of uh, industry 4.0 and all these nice technological advances and they also want to compete there and then they even very small um, erp using companies generate a huge amount of specific requirements for functionality very specific functionality and then these uh, companies that come from very simple manufacturing sites and and uh, they say well oh no we we can't do that we, we can uh, make a custom function for you especially but that's no competitive competitive advantage when you um, have to create a, a custom functionality for your first german manufacturing customer so um we we are not very satisfied with um, good looking and fast working systems with not so much functionality. So so the, and also the data model. The data model is even more important. They the people want to store all kind of information uh, around their products, their customers, their machines, and so on, and. Um, yeah, that's uh, they don't like it. And I just had an American. I once had an American vendor, a smaller American vendor. No, it was even a huge one. Uh, but I don't say its name. And um, he was asked, "Please tell us, we have to make reports, monthly reports for the value-added tax we have to collect in Germany for the for the government." And please show us your functionality. Uh, we think you are from the United States or from the UK, and perhaps you have not this functionality in your uh, home country. So what do you think of uh, this uh, value-added tax report? And the, the, the vendor from UK or US said, well, we have a very good report generator. And if you need this functionality, you can create it on your own. And uh, he thought that would be a very good answer. But he was immediately um, out of the business because uh, that's such a basic functionality for, for all European, 
for European uh, companies, uh, EU European uh, f uh, companies, uh, except the UK, uh, that um, they, they don't want to create their own uh, report for the government. They want to have it as a standard functionality. And so, so the, mm -hmm. the, um, the requirements are quite complicated in most cases. Yeah, that's part of the problem yeah, with the German market. Now, what about uh, speaking of the German market? And this is a, another question that we could probably broaden to uh, other parts of the world or other cultures. But how does the German culture affect implementation and adoption? And how is that different than implementations in other countries or other parts of the world? Well, it negatively affects implementation and adoption because uh, we want to have a complete clear picture of what we want to have in the year 2027. And uh, that's uh, quite not, it's not, not quite easy uh, we, we're in an ERP implementation and um, uh, people want to, we, 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 some, some of my uh, uh, customers also have this approach of perfection. They want to mm -hmm. have it perfect and they, they cannot live with um, 85 or 90 percent uh, perfection they want to have at least 100 percent and perfection and that is that is um, contraproductive that that mm -hmm. doesn't work well so on, on the one hand we we can create with very nice machinery and uh, also some very nice cars because we can uh, think two years uh, what the new machine or the new car would look like and then build it but that does not work in implementation uh, in erp implementation we have mm. to make it short we have to make quick wins after six months to nine months at least but then you have to show something and if you are preparing an implementation for two years and then you are as some companies were 10 years in ERP implementation. So that's ridiculous, in my opinion. So we, we try to um, uh, use agile approaches uh, there, and, but you need, you, you need trust. You, you have to trust the vendor when you start with an agile approach. Well, that's also difficult. So I think it's, um, well, German culture not always helps. Yeah, and actually, I was, it's funny you brought up culture because I was going to ask you as a follow-up. So you're saying that German culture may not embrace Agile in the same way that other no. world or other no. cultures may. Yeah. But I think in general, it's a, good, it's a good reminder, though, that whether it's a geographic culture or whether it's an organizational culture or, or a combination of both, you really do have to think about, you know, who are we as an organization and as a people, and how does that influence how we should be deploying new technology? Because I think a lot of yeah. people try to look for that cookie-cutter one size fits all best practice but the examples you just you just gave are good examples of how that's not typically the case yeah you that's that's not it. working and that's that's for, for nobody in in the uh, european market it's uh it's this cookie cutter approach uh, a fitting approach no i right. I, I, I would say that's not no that's uh absolutely not not valid it's even the other way around uh, when uh, somebody hears that his um, his main competitor has a system that he nearly also wanted to implement, then he immediately switches his decision to the other system, to, to the number two in the, in the, uh, in the rankings, because uh, he doesn't want to have the same system like his competitor. Right, right. Yeah. That's interesting. Um, well, so, that, so last question for you then um, that I've got for you is, um, based on your research so far, what advice would you give to an organization or a team that's about to start a digital transformation here in 2022? What, what's some of the, from your research, all the trends you've talked about, the things you're seeing in the market, what, uh, what yeah. should people Okay, favor quick wins, acquire knowledge, uh, be bold in your investments and hold to the original objectives when you started your project. That's... Uh, in, in one in, in one sentence, my my advice. That's great. Yeah, that's a good a summary. And those are things you mentioned uh, earlier in the in the conversation as well. So that's super, super helpful. Um, yeah, thank you very much. Well, good. Well, I appreciate you being here, uh, Norbert. If, if people want to learn more about you, connect with you, um, ask you more questions. They, they can connect to me uh, using LinkedIn, of course. I'm, I'm I can be easily found on LinkedIn. And 
uh, they, of, of course, they can uh, connect to me uh, using you as a proxy. And uh, I see some more questions. Perhaps they, they can be answered in it um, later uh, or chatting to them. Uh, sure. That would be also nice. Thank you very yeah. much. So um, just to, for people that maybe aren't, if you're watching this on LinkedIn, I'll tag uh, Professor Grenau yeah. on, on LinkedIn. But for those that aren't watching on uh, LinkedIn or are going to have to go back to LinkedIn to find you, how do you spell your last name just so people know? How to yeah, find G G R O N A U. I I don't. Let me see. So, I can... so it's Norbert Granau. G R yeah. yeah. G R O N G R O. Yeah. Unfortunately, I didn't uh, write it here on the. Uh, on but it. you you in your in your invitation, my name is uh, quite uh, correctly spelled. Yeah. Yes. So, uh, yeah, yeah, if you can't find it, reach out to me and I, I can put you guys in touch. But I yeah. uh, appreciate Fantastic. you being here on the live stream today. I really appreciate it. And I, yeah, I thank, thank you very back. much. It was a premiere for me this year. So thank you very much. Uh, and thank you for all your very good questions. Yeah, thank you. Absolutely. Yeah, and thank you to the bye audience bye. for being here as well. And uh, new live streams every two hours earlier than um, what we did today. But we, we wanted to come. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. Our, yeah, our guest guest. That's okay. I'm just for other people that might want to join these live streams uh, on an ongoing basis. It's usually yep. at 10 a.m. Eastern time in the United States, um, which I think is about, yep. what, 4 p.m. in uh, in uh, Germany um, and yep. other parts of Europe. So but, but thank when you. When we meet again in 2027, then we do it. Uh, on the <laughs> well, hopefully we'll have you on here before. <laughs> yeah, we will. We will meet before. Yeah. <laughs> thank you All very right, much. All right. Perfect. Well, thank you, everyone. Have Bye -bye. a great rest of your day. Happy New Year. And we will see you next Tuesday on our live stream. Uh, take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.